In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Fathers, brothers, and sisters, thus we have arrived to the end of our first day of a great fast. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. We, and it seems for us it is a good time to reflect on the purpose and meaning of our prayer together in continuity with the overarching theme, Ora and Labora, of this year's retreat. We have already heard psalms and beautiful hymns encouraging us to pray, to concentrate, to cleanse ourselves, to make this fast the renewal of our souls. As our abstinence and our ascetical labors increase, our own selves, which we nourish with food and thoughts, is supposed to decrease. As St. Paul says, even though our in outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. During these two days, we are called to practice silence and replace our own words with the words of the Psalms, hymns, and scriptures. We add to this physical exertion, standing upright at longer services, and ending each of the hours with prostrations, calling to the Lord and Master of our life to give us the right spirit. Although if you think these are long services, uh, I know a monastery, I've known. There is beauty, good order, and holy rhythm in the repetition of our corporate prayer, when at the best of times we feel elevated in our mind through the inspired text, even though we are exhausted by our continuous ascetical efforts, what the Russians call podvik, ascetical labor. However, at the same time, in the text that we hear, together with the call for prayer, purification, and concentration, we hear another motif, or rather a warning. In the reading from the first chapter of Isaiah, which we listen to attentively at the sixth hour, the prophet confronts the Israelites. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. And the Lord continues speaking through the prophet. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, cease to do evil, learn to do good. That is, offer inner sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord. The Lord himself calls us not to heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, the command which we heard today actually in one of the traparia of the three old canon. Let us anoint the head of our soul with the oil of compassion and let us not use vain repetitions when praying to our Father in heaven and let us bless and exalt him above all forever. If we listen, we will hear that in the readings and hymns which we uh, encounter at our entrance into the fast, the Lord addresses our most distinctive, our most cherished ascetical and liturgical practices, fasting, exertions, prostrations, assemblies, repetitive prayer, and shows that in and of themselves they are worth exactly nothing. For God is ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, without beginning, uncreated, unbegotten, immortal, limitless, uncircumscribable, boundless, bodiless, changeless, etc., etc., etc. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. See that I, even I, am He, says the Lord in Deuteronomy, in, uh, in Moses' song in Deuteronomy, which we will hear tomorrow. There is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. 
and no one can deliver from my hand. Thus, if we think foolishly that by assembling together we offer God the work that he needs, requires, the work by which we can be saved through our own effort, engaging <coughs> with our God through some uh, sanctified exchange, do udes, I give something so that you may give me something. The scriptures that we read are eager to disabuse us of this notion. Quite obviously, the Lord does not seek the movement of our lips or our movement of our body, but our conversion. Yet the ascetical tradition of the church expressed among others in the rule of St. Benedict, written for the monasteries, for his monasteries, is consistent in emphasizing the sacred character of the corporate prayer. The rule says, let the monks sleep clothed and girded with belts or cords, and thus be always ready to rise without delay when the signal is given and hasten to be before one another at the work of God. That's how daily office is called, Opus Dei, the work of God. Thus also the Byzantine monastic founder, St. Theodore the Studite, calls his monks when they hear the semandron, the bell calling for the service, to leave their manual work and rush to the church, for the liturgy is served every day. At the same time, in Palestine, the dwellers of caves and cells scattered in the gorges and ravines near the Lavra of St. Sabas would make an effort every Saturday to travel some distance through rough terrain to gather with the dwellers of other cells in the Catholicon for the vigil of our Lord's resurrection, returning after receiving communion, returning afterwards to their cells to engage in their individual prayer rule and manual labor for the remainder of the week. However, the extant manuscripts of monastic orologia, book of books of hours, show us that while some private individual prayers may have been incorporated into this rule practiced by the in the cells, and among certain most certainly the meditation, the monologic prayer, the Jesus prayer would be at, at the center. The content of the individual prayer rule would not be significantly different from the hours celebrated in the monasteries, cathedrals, and parishes. Vespers, they would serve Vespers, Matins, Hours. Thus, the identity between the ecclesiastical corporate prayer and individual devotional prayer would be maintained for both the clergy, li laity, and monastics would say the same prayers, celebrate the same hours wherever they are. Close connection between our joint celebration and our individual prayer is maintained in the way the most distinct distinctive prayer of the Lenten season, the prayer of St. Ephraim, should be recited strictly according to the typicon of St. Sabbath. According to this rule, after the priestly blessing at, uh, at the end of Martins, quote, we shall stand up with our arms raised on high, praying in ourselves and saying the prayer of a venerable father Ephraim, O Lord and master of our life. And thus at once we all bend our knee. Such prescribed execution of the prayer presupposes that in the original monastic community, the prayer and prostrations are to be performed together in synaxis and in sync by the whole community, but in total silence. Saying the prayer of St. Ephraim, a short monologic three-partite prayer in one's mind. Thus the unity of corporate and individual is, prayer is maintained. The exercise of one's devotion is not seen as excuse to divide and to disperse. However, the church prayer is uh, seen uh, uh, the church community prays as one body, even though the prayer itself is silent and personal. Today's practice, of course, that we know and see in churches is a concession, because we could not rely on, the church could not rely on 
people remembering prayer of St. Ephraim by heart, knowing it by heart, now the practice developed of the priest saying it for the entire community. But nevertheless, it doesn't actually relieve us from the duty of saying that prayer ourselves together in our mind. The, this unity between the individual and corporate prayer, the devotional and the ecclesiastical, and the necessity of the synaxis strikes for us at the of gathering, strikes for us at the core of our theological vision for our liturgy. We do not offer prayers to God because by them alone we seek to be saved. For our salvation is in the hands of God alone. We assemble together in worship as one body because God revealed himself to us so that we may know him in the, to the extent to which we are able. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We of ourselves do not have anything to offer God. For God, through his only begotten Son, offered himself to us, opened up the riches of wisdom, knowledge, sanctification, freedom, so that we may drink from this font abundantly. Senephrim the Syrian says in his hymn on, hymns on faith, Every time I meditated upon you, I acquired a treasure from you. Every time I thought of you, a spring gushed from you, and I drew as much as I could. Lord, your font is concealed from whoever does not thirst for you. Your treasure is empty to whoever hates you. Love is the keeper of your heavenly treasure. The only way to properly know God, who is our life, whose knowledge is implanted in our very being, is to worship him, to prostrate before him in love, adoration, amazement, thanksgiving, surrendering ourselves, decreasing our stature, our physical substance, so that Christ may come to dwell in us, us all and in each one of us. And this is why we are here. We, are, we have nothing to offer God. Our virtues and efforts are, few, are futile, but in essence, but our prayers, hymns, virtues, and prostrations ultimately are not ascetical or devotional. They are liturgical. They are fruit of our adoration, worship, and amazement. We are awestruck uh, by the ineffable mystery that has been opened to us. Christ celebrated his high priestly liturgy by offering himself as a, as a high priest and victim on the altar of the cross. And thus perfection for us is not found in our feeble human virtues. It is found in the cross of Christ. Through our assembly together, we do not seek to grow wings and shed our stinking bodies to fly up to the sky. We do not, like in fairy tales, design ropes to climb, climb up into the heavens. We can celebrate the heavenly liturgy present in our midst, for Christ is in our midst, as he promised. And where the Lord of the angels is, there the angels in their unceasing worship is also. All of us baptized Christians are the nation of priests. We are all consecrated priests of God and we gather together to fulfill our priestly duty, offering to God a priestly service for which we all are able, the thanksgiving and praise in our hearts, raising up our, our hands daily as the spiritual sacrifice. We are the nation of priests where Christ is the high priest, whoever stands in our midst, the only medi mediator between God and mankind. The Lord says at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this is not just a word of encouragement and assurance. For the Lord most assuredly is in his prepared dwelling place, in his temple, in the place of worship and place of his unique presence. The glory of the Lord fills the house of the Lord. He is with us forever, for we are his house. We are his true temple, composed of the living souls of men and women. 
The true temple of God is the body of Christ, of which we all are members, united to Christ through baptism, through Holy Eucharist, and through our corporate prayer. And Christ our God, God's Son and Word, is most assuredly with us, showing us who we are, for He is the purpose, goal, and the source of our being. Truly and very correctly, our former Dean, Father Alexander Schmemann of Blessed Memory, indicated that in liturgy, the Church reveals who she is, her identity. In the prophecy of Zechariah, which was read on Friday of last week, the prophet says, Come, let us go to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the, the Lord of hosts. Our identity is clear, but our task is not complete. And we are now on our annual journey together to the cross, to the tomb, to the most radiant night of uh, our Lord's resurrection, which is ultimately leads beyond the annual Pascha to the kingdom. On this journey, we cannot go on our own. We are not sufficient. We require the grace of God, and we require one another supporting us with prayer and example supporting our prayer and effort with theirs. We are here because we seek to worship God, to know Him, because what <clears throat> is, but also because what is here is more than a sum total of us as individuals. Our assembly is here and now, but it is not limited uh, to this time and this space. It includes the living and the dead. For we ultimately need reliable guides on our journey. We need the words and wisdom of those who themselves passed through uh, to the never-ending day of the Lord and were glorified among the saints. We use their words transcribed in hymns, prayers, even rubrics and typica, for their words take us out of our fixation on what we, what we want, what we need, or what we think we know. Their words, passed with the flow of the church's tradition, get, actually get to the truth of our state, except, express the truth of our reality better than any word which we can compose in our minds. However, St. Isaac the Syrian in one of his homilies, makes the task even more challenging for us. He says, In the verses of your psalmody, do not be like a man who borrows words from another, lest you imagine that you are diligently increasing your work on meditation, while in fact you are left utterly devoid of compunction and joy. So don't be limited just to repetition of the words. Rather, Recite the words of Psalmody as your very own, that you may utter the words of your supplication with insight, like a man who, underst who truly understands his work. So, of course, we can expand these words and say that in our corporate prayer, in our synaxes, in our assemblies, we are called to listen to the words of the Psalms, prayers, scriptures, and hymnography, as if they are our own. In 1928, our another former dean, Father George Florovsky, wrote with regards to the scriptures and the patristic writings, but we can apply this to the liturgy as well. He said, the word of God and the writings of the fathers, and we can add hymnography, prayers, traparia, stichera, have been written for us. The teaching of the faith, of course, we would add, of which the liturgical poetry is a crucial component. The teaching of the faith not, is there not, uh, uh, not only, the, uh, we should not only, to, only protect it, 
It is there so that we may grow in it. It is not just there so that we may keep it, but so that we may live and breathe with it. Thus, when we are gathered here during this Lent, once again, we are called to run to the church when we hear the bell calling for prayer. We are called with fear, trembling, adoration, and amazement, stand before Christ, who is and ever shall be in our midst. Let us together attend to the inspired words as our own, trying to discern at least one word, one phrase, one image through which Christ speaks to us. Let us fulfill our mission to serve the Lord with fear, so that by seeing our prayer, others may say, again, in the words of the prophet Zechariah, let us go with you, let us come to you, for we have heard that God is with you. Amen.